Welcome to Season 2, Episode 3 of Solar Punk Presence, in which we talk to J.D. Harlock about life in Lebanon. Don't forget to help us out by hitting like, subscribing to our YouTube channel, or supporting us on Patreon. Or, you know, all three! Welcome back to Solar Punk Presents. Today we'll be hearing from J.D. Harlock, poetry editor at Solar Punk Magazine. Although maybe some of you would have liked to hear what he's looking for in Solar Punk poems, we decided to talk to him about the situation where he lives, because he lives in Beirut, and that is a serious situation. To make a long story short, Lebanon was carved out of the remains of the Ottoman Empire after its collapse during World War I and became part of the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon, there was sort of colonialism light, a sort of catch, strengthen, and then release to independent sovereignty program, when Lebanon and Syria were deemed ready to be independent states. Obviously, history unfolded otherwise. Lebanon gained its independence from France in 1943, during World War II, when France was too busy being occupied by the Nazis to do anything about it. Things were stable in Lebanon until 1975, when civil war erupted between a considerable number of sectarian factions, and that didn't grind to a halt until 1990. Meanwhile, Lebanon was occupied by Syria from 1976 till 2005, and by Israel from 1985 until 2000. To date, Lebanon's economy and infrastructure have never recovered. Meanwhile, since 2019, Lebanon has been in the midst of a severe financial crisis, with widespread unemployment and hyperinflation, such that 80% of the population is now poor, and Lebanon is on the brink of becoming a failed state. And yet, J.D. believes in solar punk, and I really wanted to hear about that. So hi, J.D. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us today. If we can start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. So my name is uh, Jay Dumani. I was born in New York in 1996, but I've spent my entire life in Lebanon. I've only been to the U.S. once since I was born, and I got to meet uh, George R. R. Martin during my time there. Oh, excellent. Um, in general, I've spent my entire life around the Middle East. My dad used to work in Saudi Arabia, then Jordan, so we'd visit him in these locations. And he also worked in Azerbaijan for a stint, so we visited him there too. But uh, he died in 2014, and the last stretch was basically in Jordan. So most of my memories are of my time in Jordan outside of Lebanon. I have a master's in international relations from the Queen Mary University of London that I got two years ago. And I'm a sci-fi and fantasy writer, I guess. I get to call myself that now. And uh, that's basically it. Okay. Oh, I'm, 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 my condolences about your father. That must be, oh, that, that must be that horrible. Years. No, no. I mean, yeah, it was horrible, but you know. Uh, it happens. Okay. Um, so, gosh, so you've you've been all over, but um, can you tell us a little bit about? So you're living in Beirut now. I've um, I spent my entire life in Beirut. Oh, right. Okay. Um, my dad can used you ta- to work abroad, and we would visit him on holidays. But uh, okay. But I, I, I've, yeah, I've been living in Beirut uh, forever at this point. Okay. Oh, so you know the ins and outs. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Because so, most of us have never been there. Oh, uh, okay. So Beirut is actually, Lebanon is so centralized to the point that even though the population is around 4 million, Beirut has 2 million people in it. It's a big city and it's basically the heart of the country. And really you can't get much done unless you move to Beirut or you live in the outskirts near Beirut. If you go out Farther than that, especially to the south, it's basically no man's land and there isn't much life there. There isn't much you can do. There aren't that many universities or schools or jobs. So everyone's kind of forced to migrate to Beirut if they're not already there. Is it it's very crowded or it's very is it is it a sprawling city? Yes. Is it a tall city? Yeah. Is it especially especially since the Syrian civil war? So when uh, the Iraq war happened. We had an influx of Iraqi refugees, and they eventually uh, eventually resettled uh, elsewhere. And then when the Syrian civil war happened, we got an influx of 2 million refugees from Syria, and we're only 4 million people. So basically, there was a 50% increase in the population that the country couldn't handle uh, because of the war. 
And it's been crowded ever since then. I mean, it was always kind of crowded. Two million people in a city is too much, I think. Yeah, that is a big city. Uh, so what's Lebanon like as a as a country to live in? Most of the Arab lands were under Ottoman rule for 300 years. Then at the end of World War One, when the Ottoman Empire dissolved, we fell under the French mandate for around 20 years. And French... Basically, everyone had to learn French. And to this day, we still have a significant French-speaking population. And our official languages are French and Arabic. And Lebanon's considered the most westernized of Middle Eastern countries, outside of Israel, of course. People here don't speak Arabic that well. It comes as a surprise because people usually come here to try and learn Arabic. But then when they try to find people to speak Arabic with, they actually have trouble finding people who speak Arabic we're a lot more westernized than people realize like for most people everyone listens to either western music or watches western tv shows and films or reads western literature and if you don't fall in line with that if you stick to Arabic which very few people do uh, you're you're going to be locked out of the business sector the cultural sector that kind of stuff so it's kind Mm -hmm. of mandatory to learn at least English or French especially for financial reasons, because like if you want to try and work outside of Lebanon and other Arab countries, you're going to have trouble if you don't know English, at least. So do you speak French or just Arabic? No, and English? just Arabic and English, because you have two choices. You can either no one no one can study in Arabic in Lebanon. You either study in English or in French. And Arabic is a secondary language they teach you. Uh, wow, so you that's get, crazy. Yeah, you only get two cl- two classes that are taught in Arabic. Arabic class and history, civics, geography, which is one class. So you only have two classes that are taught in Arabic. And when I was in middle school, they passed the law that mandated that everyone has to l- study English, French, and Arabic. Because they passed it late into my time in school, I never got the chance to learn French properly. On top of the fact they don't teach it that well. But I think newer generations now have had it near the beginning. So they probably can speak French a lot better than I can. Okay, wow. So what does that do to a national identity if you're not all learning your mother tongue as your primary language? Yeah, it might seem random that I went into this directly, but that's actually why uh, I introduced the country this way, because there is kind of this ongoing national debate that's been happening since the end of the Ottoman Empire's presence in Lebanon, where... There, there's these fierce culture wars between Arabists and westernized people trying to establish what a national identity is. So people who are westernized tend to present Lebanon as, its indep- as an independent entity with its own culture, with its own uh, language. Even like they don't even consider the Arabic we speak here to be Arabic. They consider it Lebanese, its own language, which it has a, a, there, there are valid arguments to this. Mm -hmm. And so basically you have these very fierce culture wars in the public and private sector constantly going on to try and pin people down into a certain identity. And most people are really uncomfortable with that. But in general, it now leans more towards an Arabist. Like the the, the Arabist side gets is favored these days. In the past, it was more the westernized side. Like uh, when our relationship with uh, the French was actually benign. Most people, when they hear about the French in the Arab world, they think of Algeria, which was like a complete atrocity, genocide, left and right, that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. In France, there was actually a sizable sector of the population that didn't want the French to leave Lebanon. They wanted the French to stay here, and they thought it would doom the country if France left. And that ended up being true. Okay, Um, when, when did France leave? 1947. Okay. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. It, wow. Yeah, because so we weren't a, like Algeria was a colony, I think, but we weren't a colony. We came in after they came after World War One, and it was officially called the mandate, not the colony. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. After they sort of chopped up the remains of the Ottoman Empire after World War One, yeah. for better and for worse, mostly for worse, I imagine. But um, so what's yeah, uh, yeah. so what's your I mean, identity? Lebanon, the, the, uh, but just Lebanon was created as a homeland for Middle Eastern Christians. That's the objective okay. of the country. And with the growing Muslim populace, that caused a lot of tensions because mm-hmm. the legally speaking, Christians were favored and they had the monopoly on the political aspects, uh, politi- uh, political, cultural and economic 
uh, sectors of the country. Eventually, that led to a brutal civil war, which is what most people know Lebanon for, between 1975 and 1990, where mm-hmm. Beirut was one of the most dangerous cities in the world, if not the most dangerous. So is that tension still there, or did that did that civil war wipe it yeah, out? Yeah, it's, it's always there. Which like the tension between Muslims and Christians? Yeah, it's it's even worse now. I think okay. <laughs> I don't think we settled it in the war. It's it's kind of ramping up again. It's kind of like the period between World War One, World War Two, where Germany was still pissed off about the outcome of World War One, and mm-hmm. you had tensions rising to the point that another war was inevitable. That's kind of what it's been like for the past thirty years in Lebanon. I mean, what's that like to live with? Uh, it's uh, you know it's terrible uh, <laughs> yeah i mean this is like everything i've described is pre crisis so we haven't even gotten to the point where like lebanon is in the uh, Le- lebanon is in crisis because the crisis starts in 2019 yeah um, when the economy collapses so what is it like to live there right now in the midst of this crisis or or tell us about this crisis so that everybody yeah. everybody knows about it so off the top of my head, there's an electricity crisis, a food shortage, a medicine shortage. We basically have to treat currency the way people in the Soviet Union did, where we have to hoard dollars and constantly go to the exchange rate to exchange our dollars for rubles. There's always there's hyperinflation now, so like every other week, we have to kind of play a game to see whether like should I hold on to my dollars and wait till it goes up a bit, or spend my dollars now and maybe it'll go down a bit in a week the lebanese currency i mean right um, right what's it called yeah. what's the uh, name of Le- the currency lira uh lira. no it's okay. called lebanese pound but we call it lira so pre-crisis it was the norm since the end of the civil war for everyone to have a generator like every building or neighborhood to have a generator to provide electricity because the government was incapable of providing electricity 24 7 and when the crisis happened, they weren't capable of providing it at all. So for two years, between, I think, early 2020 or like early 2021, and maybe a couple of months ago, we lived in like complete darkness for most of the day because the generator we have could only provide electricity for 10 hours. We basically didn't have any electricity at night. Whenever we needed medicine, we basically had to go around asking people do you know someone who's going to the US or going to Europe or some other country that can buy medicine and bring them back with them? And what kind of medicine like are you little, talking about? Any any medicine. Like if so you we're have talking diabetes. Like, so, so yeah. okay, super like, critical ca- things like insulin. Too. Oh my God, yeah, yeah, that's can- crazy. Yeah, yeah, cancer medication. Because my aunt has cancer. And uh, I think they have to like get it for her from somewhere. Wow. And wow. from some company. I'm not sure which one. Uh, yeah, like it's basically that like, no electricity so like i'm trying to i want to like articulate it in a better way mm-hmm. but i i i'm not being able to cuz like it doesn't sound as bad as it really is the way that I'm sounds bad it. i mean you can't get I mean, it that i mean can make it sound worse i feel like i'm not doing it justice <laughs> i mean without I electricity like... without electricity you can't work yeah. on a computer you can't cook you probably don't have phones <laughs> i mean uh, yeah. you don't have heating if you need it i mean Everything takes yeah. electricity. Because of global warming, the heat levels have rit- risen to record rates. So Lebanon isn't like other Middle Eastern countries. We actually have snowy mountains. One of the things we're lauded for is the fact that you can go skiing and then go to the beach in the same day because the mountain is just like two hours away. Okay. And a lot of people would just go skiing then directly to the beach. It's like one of the main tourist attractions. And with global warming rising, we've What's happening is this desertification and we're reaching record high heat rates and I have high blood pressure. So like in summer, at, on certain days, it feels like me or my mom are being cooked alive. Like we actually have to like go to the shower and take like a cold shower or dunk water on ourselves every couple of hours because of just how bad the heat's gotten in Lebanon, especially with Lebanon, with, with Beirut since 1990 experiencing massive reconstruction that destroyed most of the you know like the natural element of the city like there are no more trees there are no more lakes they all got removed and destroyed just so we can build concrete buildings on top of concrete buildings okay so it's a real heat island now yeah yeah 
Uh, wow. Yeah, it's, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So, so I have a question for you, and it's kind of related to. So, I I would like to ask what it's like to be a a younger person in a in Lebanon right now. But let me get back to that one, and let me ask you: Are, are a lot of people migrating out okay. of Lebanon? Uh, let me explain it this way. It's gonna take a bit, but like it'll give a clear picture, not just of Lebanon, but the entire world. So, Lebanon has one of the worst passports in the world. Us in Syria, we we rank in the bottom ten. We're only mm-hmm. allowed to go to, I think, 20 countries visa-free. Mm-hmm. And like the American passport, I think you can go to 160 countries visa-free. Lebanon only lets you go to 20 countries visa-free. And these are not great countries. These are some of the, I, I there's no better term, worst countries in the world. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, in Lebanon, one thing we're notable for is that the, the, the uh, diaspora, diaspora, I don't know how mm-hmm. to pronounce it. I don't uh, either, actually. The, the expats. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, so like the expats, there's 15 million Lebanese expats. That's what that's what it's estimated at. No one's sure exactly, but there are more expats outside of Lebanon than inside Lebanon, mm-hmm. uh, for a long list of reasons I don't want to get into. But basically, mm-hmm. a lot of people have second passports, like Canadian, American, that kind okay. of stuff. Like actually, most Arab Americans are Lebanese, and most I think Arab Canadians are Lebanese too. Mm-hmm. So. Like, unless you have a secondary passport, it's almost impossible for you to migrate. Like, you'd need an SDEM degree, and then you'd have to, like, kind of sneak into a master's program, then a PhD program, or you'd have to know French and then go do a master's in France, and then they might hire you. Or you have to get, like, a PhD some way, and it's expensive to get a PhD, especially if you only speak English, since uh, they, they cost a lot of money in English. So, like... A lot of people have been migrating at record rates, but uh, most people are just trapped. Like they either are stuck with a Lebanese passport uh, or didn't study uh, or didn't study an STEM subject in college. And I, I forgot to mention this. This is important. So like pre-crisis, we had a 46% unemployment rate. I think now we're at 70 or 80% unemployment. When yeah. does that boil over? Into, <laughs> into so when what? do people say enough and go crazy? Uh, it boiled over before the crisis. So we had like the Lebanese revolution that everyone was like buzzing about. They used the peaceful approach. Mm-hmm. And the people who control the country are vicious warlords who have been accused of genocide multiple times. So I mean mm-hmm. like standing in the city center and just calling for your rights isn't going to work. Like either it has to boil over into a war or you mm-hmm. just have to accept the situation as is. And mm-hmm. because, like I mentioned, a lot of Lebanese people have secondary passports or family abroad or that kind of stuff, uh, it lessens how bad the crisis is felt. So we get six billion in remittances every year from expats, okay. like just family members abroad who send money. And now mm-hmm. it's cheaper for them to take care of their families in Lebanon. So in a way, for some people, the crisis was kind of a blessing because it made the country cheaper. Again, this is why it doesn't boil over. Like it actually boiled over before the crisis, but then after the crisis, some of the reasons for it to boil over lessened. People have just kind of accepted it. No one wants to risk their life and die for this country. No one sees it as worth it. It's difficult to get up, to leave Lebanon if you don't have the privileges, you know, of the privileged class. But it's not impossible, and I think most people just want to do do their time in Lebanon, then find a way out and just leave and not. Uh, you know, risk their life for a country that isn't worth it at the end of the day. Let me ask you about your community, the people that you interact with on a daily basis. What are they like? I mean, at this point, I think most of the people I know have migrated. The people who are left in general, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, like everyone's kind of miserable all the time. Everyone's stressed out. No one's really happy. Uh, Everyone's either trying to think up a way of leaving or is planning to leave soon. People tend to ignore the crisis. Like, we just generally lead our lives without talking about it or pretending it's not happening. Yeah, it, it, there really isn't a strong sense of community anymore. There never really was, but especially in Beirut now, it's completely gone. Uh, people don't know their neighbors in Beirut. People don't uh, interact outside of, you know, their school or university circles. And now that those have dispersed, no one really, we're all kind of isolated and our suicide rates have tripled. I, last year, they tripled amongst people my age from the age of 20 to 30. 
it's bleak anyway you look at it and there's no community wow yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> that's how uh no I, wow. i'm laughing not because i think this is good but like just because when i wh- when i started talking about lebanon i realized how absurdly bleak the situation is like there really is no hope spot it's just like completely bleak over the top bleak and there doesn't there is no solution how do you personally deal with that you know i lead my life i write i watch mm-hmm. youtube i wa- uh, i read books that kind of stuff i mean i just carry on like it's not happening yeah it's true you 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 really you do write a lot and you do seem i know you are you still the poetry editor at solar punk magazine you are aren't you yeah yeah and you have you also do other work for other magazines or what are yes, you up to at I'm the moment i'm an outreach manager at utopia sf mhm and i'm an editor at large at wasafiri oh what what's that It's this London-based magazine. They have an editor-at-large program for MENA editors. And basically, they train you across two years in editing, that kind of stuff. Okay, but most, what, of my, most of my money comes from writing articles for magazines. Yeah, so that's handy that they that you can I guess you can be a digital nomad without going anywhere. Yeah. I guess yeah. <laughs> is how you would put it. What kind of things do you write for these magazines? I've basically only been writing cultural critique i basically analyze movies and tv shows using marxist theory the, the, that's the bulk of my non-fiction writing how did you yeah. fall into something like that i mean my family as far back as my grandpa we've been you know marxists my grandpa was in the communist party my mom is too lebanese communist okay. party i think the communist party in lebanon is the oldest political party active in Lebanon to this day. So I think it's also the oldest political party in the uh, the Middle East. What kind of power do does the Communist Party have then in Lebanon? It used to be extremely powerful. It used to okay. be yeah, it used to be one of the yeah, it used to be probably the most powerful outlying party that was never really allowed into government because you know the US would come in and like stop any attempt of socialists or communists to try mm-hmm. and take over. I I can go into more detail but these days because a certain party was created and then another one these two parties took most of the communist base away from the communists by bribing them so the communist party has been left especially with the fall of the Soviet Union has been left underfunded and there really isn't the the base has like gone the other way into other directions so there's really no nowhere to recruit anymore So you can't put any hope in the Communist Party to help fix um I mean there's a new generation of westernized uh Marxists but they kind of clash with these old school uh, Lebanese Marxists because these old school Lebanese Marxists are in the Soviet Union mold and they're usually anti-western so like the new generation is more of the kind of people you'd see in SFF where it's like you know liberal LGBTQ that kind of stuff so What there's SFF a huge... Oh, science fiction, fiction and fantasy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, you know, liberal. Uh, right. Theater. Okay. I see what yeah. you mean. Like usually that kind of youth in Lebanon is drawn towards communism these days. And there's a clash, a cultural clash between them and the old guard, which is more in the uh, the Soviet Union mold, which is anti-Western. But maybe that brings us to an interesting question about narratives. What what is the prevailing narrative that's kind of running through everyone's head in Lebanon at the moment about what the future will be like or bleak? bleak. Okay, it's really just bleak. Yeah. Um some people are really worried another war will happen, but that's been a thing since before the crisis. Everyone's kind of constantly afraid of an, uh, another civil war happening, but mm-hmm. it hasn't yet and I don't think it will happen for some time. Do you think there is a way out of this crisis? No. You think this will just carry on and on for decades and decades? I mean it's carried on like the war the civil war was in 1975 it ended in 1990 and we've been like this since 1990 basically before that it was worse you know with the war so yeah I think it'll just keep going on like this for another couple of decades until like the warlords are dead but even then I feel like they've consolidated so much power they've eaten up most of the country's wealth and control it as personal assets that it might be like this forever unless another war happens to change the balance. And so how do 
people survive in the day to day, but if, if they don't have ways of bringing dollars in, if they don't have family outside or they, they can't work as an editor or as a writer, how do those people survive? They don't. That's the... <laughs> That's the nicest way I can put it. Like there's a, I remember seeing an article a couple of days ago about this crisis we're having. So Lebanon has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Basically, we have this generation because Lebanon was extremely developed between 1945 and 19, uh, 1947 and 1975. We were one of the richest countries in the world. We had one of the highest living standards. Uh, people used to call us the Paris of the Middle East, and you had this extremely liberal. Uh, youth growing up that was virtually identical to like some western youth you'd meet and a lot of them didn't get married and have kids now they're getting up there in the years then their 70s and their 80s and they don't have anyone to take care of them and the state social security in lebanon has been completely gutted since the end of the civil war so now they're just kind of starving in their apartments people kind of take pity on them maybe give them food but you have like this entire class of elder people who aren't being taken care of and are probably dying in their apartments without med- medication or food or anything in the way of assistance. Oh, that's incredibly, incredibly horrible. Um, yeah, like I was describing this to my uh, friend, I mean my cousin on the phone. And I, when I go down to Hamra Street, which used to be one of the richest streets in, La- in Beirut, I see like Syrian refugees begging on every corner or Syrian women prostituting themselves on every corner. There are people sleeping on the streets, like long lines of people sleeping on the streets. Whenever you see a garbage can, there are Syrian refugees like scouring through them, trying to find stuff they can sell in them. And yeah, like it's uh, it's like every time I go down to that street, it's more and more like Mad Max. Wow. Um, what's interesting to me is that you have an interest in solar punk. Yeah. So, which is I mean, all I, I about, solar, yeah. <laughs> which is all about telling stories to organize people to start working on a better future, da 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 da. Yeah. And yet, you seem to think that you're in a situation that's like a black hole, and there's no escape from it. There's no amount of energy you could, you could not work up the escape velocity. So, how do you reconcile these two things? I feel like there's hope for the world, just not the Middle East. I feel like maybe once the world reaches a utopian level. Maybe it will trickle back down onto the Middle East. But uh, I mean, like these problems were created way before I was born and Mm -hmm. they're not simple to solve. I mean, like the Palestinian issue has been going on and it's still going strong 18, 80 years later. That's just one of many conflicts in the Middle East that haven't been resolved and it's been almost a century. That's just the one that gets the most attention. But there are so many. Okay, yeah. And so your family actually came over from Palestine to to Lebanon. My my dad's side did. Okay. Yeah. So is there... Yeah. Is there a lot... Yeah, the stupid question. Never mind. Strike that one. I was going to ask if people are angry, but of course people are angry about this. I mean, yeah, everyone's angry about everything at this point. (laughs) I (laughs) I don't think anyone's satisfied with anything. The thing about Lebanon is... Even though it's such a small country, it's it's really uh, it's a really complex situation with a lot of factors that need to be thoroughly understood. Like you have to understand the sectarian divide of the country and where each sect leans politically and who are the state backers of these sects outside of Lebanon and that kind of stuff that kind of begin to grasp what's going on now and why it's going on and how did this develop because alliances constantly shift and it's this whole uh, jumble, of, like a mess that would take forever to untangle. What do these people want? Obviously, no one is in it to make the world or to make Lebanon a better place to live in. So what do these different groups want? And it's how so, do you how do you not become completely cynical if you know about all of this? No, I feel like because most countries aren't Lebanon. I mean, most of them are not as complex and troubled as Lebanon is. I mean, it was only... 80 to 60 years ago that we had the golden age kind of. um so how did it what went wrong how did it go wrong oh oh my, oh my uh that is a very so i i think i alluded to it a bit but basically lebanon was created as a homeland for the christians mm-hmm. but because there was a famine during world war one uh that killed off most of the populace some people think it was actually a genocide so the Ottoman Empire is thought to have committed three genocides during World War One against the Christian minorities. One of them is the Armenian Genocide, which is getting a lot of attention these days. There's the other one I can't remember for uh, against uh, Assyrians. 
And the third one was supposedly against Lebanon through a famine, through an engineered famine. And so when they came to create this uh, Christian state in the Middle East, they were forced to expand its borders and include more Muslim minorities that they didn't want to include because these Muslim minorities were living on farmland that could be cultivated to feed the state in case another famine would happen. So that kind of set in motion the primary tension, which is the fact that the Christians back then controlled most of the state and had the laws catered in their favor. But the Muslims were slowly slowly growing in numbers. And eventually these tensions mixed in with, you know, Soviet era socialist versus right wing tensions kind of exploded into this civil war with, I think, 15, 20 sides that were all forming alliances uh, against each other, with each other. I mean, they all like kind of allied with each other at one point, then betrayed each other. And then you have states getting involved in it, like the Assad regime in Syria, uh, the, the father, not the son we usually talk about. Uh, mm-hmm. Hafez al-Assad. And like you have Israel getting involved, you have the US getting involved, you have France getting involved, you have the Soviet Union to certain stats. So you have all these. And then eventually when the Iranian revolution happened in 1979, Iran became, became heavily involved. And so you have all these militias funneling billions of dollars, duking it out. I, I don't know. Like I, I, I've I never had to but- actually explain Lebanon before. So now that I'm saying it, I realize how impossible it is to just give a that proper is- straight answer. But what was what was the game they were all playing? I mean, why were all of these outside actors interested? That's I guess uh, this is just geopolitics, the Cold War I mean, it's kind of thing. Control over Lebanon, but the mm-hmm. thing is, there are so many sides. Like I even left out a couple of countries by accident, like Saudi Arabia and Libya, that were involved mm-hmm. in the civil war in Lebanon. Like the the entire point was to control Lebanon, and control of Lebanon would happen through backing the correct sect. Mm -hmm. And these sects usually aligned with the religion of the country that was backing them, usually not in every case. Mm -hmm. And eventually that the war dragged on for 15 years and a compromise had to be reached in 1990. But the Mm -hmm. compromise, uh, most people weren't fine with it. And that basically set up further tensions that lead to this day. The main thing we hear about Lebanon at the moment in the news is about all of these people who go into the bank and Hold on and rob yeah. the bank to get their own money out of that. Is yeah. that is that truly really common? Yeah, it's happened. I think like a dozen times. I oh, mean, okay. it happened. I think like four times in two weeks because like it worked for one guy, so another three people tried it. And has that come to an end now? I mean, eventually someone's gonna pull it off, pull it off again. The thing is, things aren't what they appear. The way the Western media reports on it, so mm-hmm. it's thought that a lot of these gunmen were actually had ties to political parties, and that these events were staged so that the political parties can figure out a way to give their supporters the money in dollars without having to make it look like an illegal transaction behind the scenes. So yeah, so you have the supporters of certain political parties staging these fake heists and being given their money. But like, there's actually no danger, and this whole thing is fake. They already made the agreement behind the scenes, and this was just the way to give them the money okay, and absolve so this, themselves. Yeah, this isn't like, just normal people desperate. No. Some are, oh, some okay. are, but not all okay. of them. Some of them are just, you know, like it's it's less shady to give it to him and give give that person the money in a heist, mm-hmm. because like if you give it to him behind the scenes, everyone's gonna get upset and they're like, why do you give it to him? Give it to me. Mm-hmm. By making it seem like a bank heist. So you are, I guess you are quite cynical about the I'm whole situation. That, like, uh, even though I'm saying this is a theory, I think for like a couple of them, it's it's actually, you know, everyone knows that's what happened. It's not like a conspiracy theory or anything. No, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I, I didn't mean it that way. But just, uh, I mean, so if you have to face all of this and yet you seem, you don't seem outraged, you seem like you accept it. I, I've seen corruption you people wouldn't believe i'm just quoting blade runner um no like uh, <laughs> yeah like i've seen corruption you people wouldn't believe like uh this is so minor in the grand scheme of things i mean to me like this is a guy getting his money back like i've seen corruption that like would have jaws drop like this is so minor in the list of things i've seen uh, pulled off in lebanon in front of me even as a kid like you would see a lot of stuff like this being pulled off by teachers or uh, people your family knew and that kind of stuff so this is to me, part of the fabric of Lebanon, like it's not very unusual. 
So is is corruption at the heart of the problem? Yeah, yeah, it's one of the and, pillars of the problem. We're actually one, we're ranked as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And it's such a difficult thing to get rid of when it's endemic yeah. in a system, and yet it's I mean it eat it eat it eats holes in the the structural supports of of communities and countries, and I mean it's it's one of the worst things that people do, I think. It's worse than Lebanon because there's a sectarian angle to it. So when I mean sectarian, I mean religious sects. Mm-hmm. And so like the corruption falls along sectarian lines because the political parties are are organized along religious sectarian lines. So like the Christians will have a party, the Shia Muslims will have a party, the Sunni Muslims will have a political party, that kind of stuff. So the corruption usually happens within these communities. So on top of the fact that there's this political allegiance, there's also this community cultural allegiance that factors into the corruption, where if you try and stop someone from being corrupt, from, who's from your own uh, religious sect, you're going to have community pressure on you to not do that because you're not supposed to take down one of your own. So I guess for you, an escape valve is is science fiction and utopian science fiction. Yeah, like me and my friends have basically reached a conclusion where like there's no point in engaging with the state or the community to try and fix anything we should just focus within focus on improving ourselves our skills and our careers and you know play it day by day and eventually you know if we work hard enough uh, something will come of this and we'll hopefully either be able to leave or survive on our own in lebanon so you younger people, <laughs> this younger generation, you're very, very savvy. You're very technologically savvy, yeah. internet savvy. You're very outward looking. I think you're more outward looking than, say, most Americans, <laughs> uh, both culturally and and politically. Um, yeah. And so you're. It's interesting the path your way you're finding through this a way to to make money. Um, and to to survive and yeah whether or not you end up leaving the country so this is an interesting twist on it I think it's very very yeah. modern. Solar punk has an anarchist bent to it, and because this generation has no faith in the state, we now have people basically trying to create self-sustainable ecosystems for themselves. So to solve the electricity problem we were having for around two years. We, we got a private generator and we're looking into installing solar panels onto the building. And if I look outside my window, most of the buildings now have solar panels on them. And even in villages that uh, are completely cut off from the government, they have solar panels now to provide electricity where the government can't. And people are finding ways to clean their water when the government can't and that kind of stuff. So even though the, the state has completely failed us, we're, we're still working towards some solar punk vision because like especially with the younger generation we're smart enough to know that there are certain problems we can solve as a local community uh, without relying on the state so it isn't completely bleak and there is is some hope of people unifying and just yeah getting disgusted and fixing things for themselves but that's also interesting because then within these ecosystems then you can get rid of things at least within the ecosystem like corruption and do you think it's possible that these spheres, these ecosystems, if you can think of them as spheres, will grow and grow and grow and maybe then fuse yeah. together? Is there is there a way out this way or am yes. I being naive? So like there's a growing call for decentralization. I started out the podcast by talking about how Beirut is centralized because I knew later on I'd have to address one of the problems with Lebanon, which is the fact that everything's centered around Beirut. The problem with the decentralization debate is that it has a sectarian angle to it that makes people blind to the benefits of decentralization. And there's a strong resistance against it because certain political parties and sects will benefit from decentralization more than others. So people don't even want to broach the issue or discuss it because of the prevailing, the just how it looks. They don't want to discuss it because of how it looks because certain people will benefit more than others. And they feel like it's a a disingenuous attempt by a political party to grab power when it's actually a good idea, even though they might benefit. I'm not going to say they're not going to, but it's still a good idea to decentralize Lebanon because like the state has completely failed. We, even though we're a small country, any attempt at relying on the government to provide anything uh, has fallen flat. And since I think like a year ago, we haven't gotten a single hour of electricity from the government. 
The reason we have 24-7 electricity is because we have a generator for the building and the private generator for the apartment. Wow, so it'll be interesting to see how this develops in the future. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to say? Would you like to, uh, be, uh, before we end this? If it wasn't um, clear wa- from the interview, I have Asperger's. Uh, that's why I've been rambling like a madman. I hope uh, uh, foreigners can make out what I was trying to say about Lebanon, and I hope I gave a clear picture of Lebanon to people out there. I think you spoke very well, and I think you have given us a very clear picture, and um, I've learned a few things, so I, I thank you for that. I want to say thank you very much for providing this eye-opening interview, yeah. this eye-opening this ramble. This, no, it wasn't a ramble, and yeah. this was. I have a lot to think about now. I didn't. I didn't know that Marxism is, was like, big in the Middle I East. I for how instance. much someone would get out of this listening to it, because there's so many details I left out that mm-hmm. would have clarified things. But if I gave those details, I'd have to clarify those details too. So to be mm-hmm. this endless loop of clarification. No, but I think you've at least painted us a, a general picture of yeah. of what's going on and that people have banded a little bit at least some people have banded a little bit together to to at least build local clusters of hope not, of something that other than hopelessness <laughs> <laughs> which is good to hear um is do you think there's anything people from the outside can do to help Lebanon the people no, of Lebanon actually, because like during when we tried to pull a revolution and then during the crisis, a lot of money came in through don- uh, in donations to local NGOs. But then it turned out that most of these local NGOs were stealing the money. So the corruption is even in the, you know, uh, an NGO is a non-gover- non-governmental organization. It's what Lebanese call non-profits. Mm-hmm. So uh, most of these non-profits ended up stealing the money. Yeah. Uh, oh, God, like, that's infuriating. Know, yeah. So like, unless you know... A Lebanese person you can directly help. I honestly wouldn't recommend donating to the nonprofits. Okay. Yeah. And then let me let me ask you one last very sensational looky loo kind of question. Yeah. What was it like to be there the day of the explosion? Oh yeah, that was unreal. Nothing like that had happened before. The thing is, I lived through the 2006 war in Lebanon with Israel, but like I was so young when that happened. And I don't really have a clear memory of it, but the explosion was like something else because we had like a relative stretch of peace for the most part since 2006. And that explosion like put put the edge back into our lives. Like we were, uh, a lot of people were really worried that the violence would return to Lebanon. And thankfully, three years on from that, it didn't. But, you know, you never know. Wow. Okay. Thank you. It sounds like you are by and large a very peaceful people. Uh, I think it's more this selfishness and general fatigue that makes us not want to involve ourselves anymore. Because really, at the end of the day, the, is the country I described to you a country you want to die for? Okay, though then you're a very sensible people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so we've seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we can end on that note. Thank you very, yeah. very much. I have enjoyed talking to you and I have learned a lot. And I think you did not ramble. Yeah, thank you. That brings us to the end of the episode. I don't really know what else to say. As JD said, it's a bleak situation. I think I now really see that you can throw off the yoke of empire and even of subsequent colonialism light, but you have to be prepared to fill the vacuum before everyone who wants to seize power for themselves or their own group rushes in and you end up with a long civil war and the spiral down into a failed state. Given how much of the world was colonized at some point by some empire or other mighty power, we could have all been born into a situation like the one in Lebanon. The rest of us merely lucked out. Thank you for listening to Solar Punk Presents, a podcast hosted and produced by Ariel Kroon and Christina Della Rocha. The audio for this episode was recorded in part on the traditional territory of the neutral Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples and in Germany. The opening and closing music of this podcast is Water Cooler Gang by Monkey Warhol, available for use under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Until the next episode, keep dreaming and keep up the good work.